So for B-cell development, this really happens in, there's physical processes and mechanisms that we can use to kind of prod, or chart, sorry, or plot, the progression of development. Um, and this is kind of starts off with the actual production of the immunoglobulin first, and then after that we have tolerance induction, which tolerance induction, I want you to think of that as synonymous with negative selection. So for the B-cell development, really you just have phase one happening here, and I'm going to do that in, in the magenta there, and then for the next one we have uh, is really just phase two, or you can think of it as negative selection, uh, where we have receptor editing and then clonal deletion happening. The functional B cell receptor development is dependent on productive sequential rearrangement of heavy and then light chain genes. And this is just kind of giving us an overview of, of the whole process that we're going to talk about. So we start off as a stem cell itself with the germline configuration, obviously. And then at the earliest to pro B cell stages, we're going to have D and J rearrangement. We're going to do this first because, as we're about to find out, this is the hardest thing for B cells to do. And then after that, we're going to have late pro B cell uh, progression where we have the V and the DJ coming together to combine. Uh, all this is just happening in the heavy chain here. And then by the time we were at the large pre B cell, um, we're pretty much done with all the heavy work, uh, pun intended, uh, for uh, having a functional VDJ uh, recombination taking place. We're going to be expressing a mu chain, um, and, but now we're going to kind of turn our attention to the light chains. So by the time we reach a small pre B cell, we've already gone through the process of making a, VG, a VJ sorry, in the light chain um, that's going to be functional. And then hopefully by the end of all of this, we will have ourselves a IgM immunoglobulin embedded into our cell membranes, for B cells at least. So the, the thing that we, we didn't really talk about when we mentioned all those various mechanisms that we can have to generate um, new, new identities of our receptor sites for B cells is the fact that they're messing with the DNA. You're, you're cutting things out, you're putting stuff in, you're moving elements from left and right, and so it, it makes sense from my perspective that the majority of the time that this is going to have things out of our reading frame sequence. Uh, and because of this, this is going to destroy nearly two-thirds of our, 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 our B cells aren't going to make it by. And this loss is going to occur chiefly during the early stages of differentiation, characterized by heavy chain rearrangement. Pun intended, but heavy chain is the hardest job, and so we want to do that first before we move on to the lighter jobs, the light chain stuff. Um, and because of their number and then the way that they are kind of disoriented, we can damage or we can make mistakes with light chain rearrangements that aren't necessarily as detrimental as that of what we had with the heavy chain, because with the light chain, we can, there's room for error. We can have uh, extra, extra choices, I guess, if you could look at it. So production of a functional and immunoglobulin receptor um, is really just dependent upon the productive rearrangement of the heavy and light chain chains required. Obviously, we need to have a functional immunoglobulin. Um, if it's the, the, the terminology that we use is that if it results in a frame shift, we say that this is a non-functional immunoglobulin protein, right? Because that's what frame shifts, <laughs> they do. They change the reading frame, right? Every amino acid is going to be wrong. And then more pre prevalent with heavy chain rearrangement than with light chain rearrangement because of the mechanisms behind those things there. So this is a diagram from the book, and it really is helpful because it kind of shows the, the processes themselves. So we have an early pro B cell. It just went from being a stem cell, now it's an early pro B cell. And the first thing we're going to do is the, the most difficult parts to deal with, which is DJ rearrangements on both chromosomes. And if this is successful, only if this is successful on, notice we're saying on both chromosomes here, um, if it's unsuccessful, then the cells are going to be killed by apoptosis. But if it's successful, then it progresses to being a late pro B cell. And then we're going to have V combining with the DJ segments. Um, hopefully this works on the first chromosome, on, on, on either the maternal or paternal chromosome that we have, because remember we have two sets of chromosomes. And if this is successful, then we're going to survive and become a pre-B cells. 50% of the cells are going to do this because of this chromosomal selectivity here. And let's just say that the first try doesn't work so well, and then we have the other chromosome that we can choose to do the exact same rearrangements, right? Because this happened on both of them. We just need to do this next step, which is easy for us. Um, and if this works, then yeah, we're going to go on. And if it doesn't, then we're going to be killed by, by apoptosis. 50% will die, 50% will pass on.
So for the ones that do uh, pass on, or at least for the ones that we're talking about in this context, they're going to become to when we start working in the light chains. But we want to first make sure that it's going to be able to bind with a light chain. So we, we've gone through the process of making a functional protein. We know that it's in the right uh, three-dimensional conformation. We've checked to make sure that it's doing everything that it has. It has the, the variable regions and all that stuff. But we need to make sure that it's going to be able to bind to uh, a light chain. And what the, we, we can't do this because we haven't done the process of making a light chain yet. Um, because we can't make the light chain until we know that the heavy chain is okay. And so we have to have a, a testing thing. And this is kind of like a testing checkpoint, if you can think of it, is the production of the surrogate light chain. And uh, this is just structurally similar to a light chain. It's not functionally similar, but it is structurally similar to a light chain. And we're just doing this to see if the uh, heavy chains is able to bind, to form that disulfide bond that's going to stabilize it and ultimately be with, stick with it for the rest of his life. Okay, so assuming that it does pass that surrogate light chain test, we're going to move on to rearranging our light chain genes. So the first thing that we do is kappa. Remember that we talked about kappa and lambda when we talked about B cell development, that they're functionally, there's no difference between the two, but I think that they arose, this is my personal opinion, that they arose from gene duplication as a, as a means to make sure that we don't have to kill so many of our B cells. And I don't know about you, but if I didn't have to kill my B cells, that's one, good for them, and two, good for me, right? So it's clearly an advantageous mechanism to have. But the first thing that we're going to do is we're rearrange the kappa gene on the first chromosome. And whenever I'm saying this like first or second chromosome, I'm meaning the maternal and paternal chromosomes that you have in pairs here. So assuming that this is successful, then we're going to just go ahead and express a mu chain and then a kappa chain. So mu in blue and then kappa is illustrated in green to give us a functional IgM. But you know, let's say that it doesn't work. That's okay. We have other kappa genes on the other chromosome that we can work. We're always going to start with kappa first. And I don't really know why. I assume that there's some specific epigenetic markers that are involved in this or maybe just, you know, the hydrogen bonding between the, the, the polymerases involved in it. But anyways, so we rearrange the kappa chain gene on the second chromosome and if this works, great. But even if this doesn't work, it's okay. We still have lambda sets and two of them, remember, from, the, from our mom and our dad. So we're going to do the same processes for each and every one of these. And if, if, if all of these fail, then we have apoptosis. But the odds of, of us failing light chain gene rearrangement is very, very low. So we're not going to waste um, too much ATP in the process of doing this because we've already gotten through with the heavy ones. The ones that have survived the heavy chain are most likely to succeed in this part here. So uh, there's certain checkpoints that we have during development in the bone marrow. And we have the early pro B cell here. This is kind of a uh, similar to like a stem cell almost at this point. And then once we start to become a pro B cells, we start having chain, uh, heavy chain rearrangements. We no longer have our germline configuration here. And in the first checkpoint, we have our pre B cell receptor. Now this is going to be working with the surrogate light chain. So I'm just going to say the... say LC, surrogate light chain with the pre-B cell receptor there. Um, the heavy chain is going to be acting for that. And if this is a functional heavy chain, if it binds great with that, then we're going to work on that's going to be awesome. If this doesn't pass this test, then we're going to end up having apoptosis, right? There's no, no backup for that. And then we have our light ch chain gene rearrangements. And also in the process of doing this, we're going to start producing IgA and IgB. And the reason why we do this is because IgA and IgB are just that survival signal. So, um, Assuming that it does work, that we do have ourselves a functional, uh, I guess in this case would be a B cell receptor, then IgA and B are going to send signals that are going to enable it to survive and develop into becoming an immature B cell. And if it doesn't, then we have apoptosis is, is the process here. But I guess some one note that you may want to make is that for B cells, for B cell, I guess, development, I'm just going to write development. These genes are always in the mode for being apoptotic. So what I mean by that is the, the genes for saying kill yourself, those are always going to be switched on unless told otherwise. So we have to get a signal that says that we shouldn't kill ourselves. Otherwise, the, the default setting for, for B cells is for them to kill themselves. That's, that's sad to me. But anyways... Um, so 
They, uh, when we talked about the maternal and paternal chromosomes existing in pairs, notice how we said that we're going to try for one, and if that one works, great, and if, the, if it doesn't, then we'll try with the other of the pair. And this is the concept of allelic exclusion, if you don't remember that from when we talked about B cell, I think, receptor development, or B cell receptor variation mechanisms. Um, this prevents us from making more than one mu chain, but it also makes sure that we eliminate any ones that don't make a functional mu chain. And so uh, the way that this works at, at the, the mechanistic level is the fact that chromatin is going to be reorganized into a state that really resists gene rearrangement after we've produced a functional protein. So if it passes that test with the uh, surrogate light chain, we're going to stop transcription of RAG genes, we're going to break down all the RAG protein, and we're going to condense it up our chromatin. Um, in case you don't remember from your general biology how this works, we're going to go ahead and add methyl groups there, and we're going to have acetylation, deacetylation, taking place in our, in our DNA. Okay, so successful gene rearrangement of a single intact immunoglobulin chain. This, the, the process of doing this is going to send out signals um, that, that are going to make us say, okay, we've succeeded. We don't need to waste any more of our precious ATP doing rearrangement and creating damaging cells. Uh, and so this signals initiation of the other chains to start kind of rearranging. And so the ending of one process is also the activation signal for the other. And so at the end of product, what we get is a B cell with a surface immunoglobulin receptors of single specificity, right? And that shouldn't be too much of a shock to you. That's, I hope that's not a shock to you, at least. Um, so here we see the, the development of genes here. There's the variable, there's the D, J in this context, uh, and then the C, mu region here. And as we have recombination taking place, we begin to develop this heavy chain gene here. This is going to be compatible with the surrogate light chain, hopefully. And then if it's compatible with the surrogate light chain, we start to make ourselves a actual light chain. And in doing so, we develop into becoming a immature B cell, which develops to become a mature B cell, which develops to, you know, fight infections. Hooray! So let's talk about the stages here that we have.